I'm going to talk about kind of legislative issues and to start things off. I'll be brief because you really want to, to listen to, to Jim, and I'm not sure if Bloody Marys or Hemlock are more appropriate when we think about $50 crude. But when you think about what's going on in Washington right now, it, from a regulatory perspective in the oil and, oil and gas industry, there's not much going to happen on the legislative side, right? Congress isn't going to pass anything. I don't know, gridlock's good in, in that perspective. But there's, from, a, from a regulatory standpoint, there's going to be a, a lot done in the next 18 months. And why does that matter? It matters from a visibility standpoint. If, if you've got legisla leg legislation being debated and passed in the houses, you can kind of see what's coming. If the EPA says, hey, we're going to worry about the snail darter in the you know, middle Mississippi River, whatever, that can happen overnight without as much warning. So it's, it's a little tricky if you're an energy guy uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen in the next 18 months, again, because th there's it's more stroke of a pen than actually kind of fulsome debate. Um, folks on the other side would disagree with that assessment, but I'll stand by that. Um, um, broad opinion. And so what are the things that could happen uh, regulatorily? Um, this, this is, you probably have to have some legislation on, on oil exports. If you talk to industry guys, remember the U.S., we're effectively not allowed to export crude oil from the U.S. That's gaining some traction in Washington. If you talk to industry folks, they're very optimistic that that could get done. Um, if you actually talk to lobbyists, the lobbyists don't think there's enough education uh, in Congress, which is <laughs> an understatement, um, uh, particularly on this, on this issue. So what, what does that mean? They're, the lobbyists are afraid that you push something too fast and you end up with a keystone pipeline where the, the other side of it gets a hold of it and you haven't educated the politicians and the, 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 their staff enough and they don't know and they're just going to take a stand against it. And once you're against it, it's hard to, 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 to change. So I, I, our, our opinion would be oil exports happen is probably the next, the next administration. Um, but the, the word I hear from Washington is just be patient. In the industry, we're not a patient group. So the concern is the industry guys push this a little too fast. That's something to worry about. <laughs> Rail regulation. It's, it's happening, tank cars, you can get into a lot of um, issues around uh, tank car safety and, and really the, 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 we've kind of brought this on ourselves because we're apparently allergic to new pipelines. Pipelines are the safest way to, to transport crude oil, but we can't put new pipelines in the ground, so we're going to stick it on rail cars, which are inherently unsafe. So does there need to be regulation? Brad Howell's in the room, he'll probably disagree, but there probably needs to be a little bit more regulation. Um, that probably, the amount of crude on rail um, likely declines over time in the next, in the near term anyway, as rig counts down and we think U.S. production will, will decline. So there's not as much growth in that, but over time that's, that's going to have to be fixed. What, what, what guys in Washington talk about a lot now is the Endangered Species Act enforcement. That's something that that's, that's, can happen pretty quickly, and, and that's, that hits... Everybody, if you have a drilling location, if you if you have a, trying to build a gathering and processing system, if you're trying to build a long haul pipe, you've got to worry about things like the long ear bat or wherever you are. There's going to be some species that, that might be in question, and that just slows things down and makes things cost more. Something you'll hear in the headlines: seismic activity via water injection. Right? There is nothing to see here. Right? Under, water injection is regulated very, very um, heavily by the feder at the federal level. You cannot inject over parting pressure. There is zero chance, in my opinion, that water injection is causing seismic activity. It makes no sense. Just because there's earthquakes in Oklahoma, right, doesn't mean that water injection is causing that. So I, I think there's nothing to hear, but this is something that's gained a lot of traction. It's scary, and it, it, makes, it makes great headlines. So when it's on Drudge Report, you know you've got a problem, okay? What isn't going away? Climate change and carbon emissions, right? That's here for a long time. Um, 
hydraulic fracturing, the, the government will continue to kind of push against that. Why? Not because they're worried about hydraulic fracturing, but hydraulic fracturing allows $4 gas. $4 gas, natural gas, allows for cheap energy prices or cheap power prices, and cheap power prices make solar and wind uneconomic. End of story. That is why there's a massive amount of pushback on hydraulic fracturing. It is not going away. Um, the, the, recent, the recent federal guidelines came out on, for, for federal lands. It's, it's really nothing to see there. It's stuff that the industry is broadly doing. They're reporting chemicals um, through frac focus. There's a couple other things. So one thing that was a little bit um, interesting is they're going to require that any produced water in the intermediate holding, you're going to have to hold it in a covered tank instead of a lined pit. I don't know. That sounds like a reasonable idea to me. Um, so again, nothing that's a game changer there. It's an annoyance. But the, the industry is on the right side of the bright line with regarding hydraulic fracturing. There's very little that, that will be done to, to impede it. But the, the opponents are not going away because it sounds scary. I, I, intangible drilling. Credits. It's tax. It's tax policy. It comes up at budget time. It, it matters for the UEP guys in the room. Uh, we won't have a tax discussion, luckily here. Um, but but it's something that matters. It, 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 it if we get into actually have corporate tax reform, that's something that we're watching pretty closely. And longer term issues. I, I had to have a map because I love this quote. But um, the, the, the Keystone Pipeline, it's a longer term issue. It's going to be, it's going to be um, uh, passed eventually. Um, I will tell you, the guys in Canada, if you've, if you've met with folks in the Canadian oil ministry or energy ministry, they are, they are not a happy group of folks. They think this Keystone thing is just ridiculous. The, the Canadian oil minister told us that it is imperative, he used the word imperative three times, that they have an alternate outlet for their crude because they no longer have a viable trading partner south of the border. So what are you going to do? You're going to put that, you're going to take that pipe either east or west, you're going to stick it on a tanker, and you're going to move it to some, and burn it in some refinery in China that doesn't have the kind of emission controls that we do. All right, you guys all remember the Exxon Valdez, right? We know that was like the largest oil spill in the history. Actually, no, it was the 38th largest oil spill, right? My kids, my kids came home in fifth grade and said, I was in Alaska when it happened, and they came home and said, wow, the Exxon Valdez, that was the largest oil spill in the world. <laughs> really? Where'd you learn that? That educational material that had it is the largest oil spill in the world. And that was my first opportunity to Im Im impact my kid's public school education. Um, and and, and so, so think about the environmental. Uh, th this makes no sense. Pipelines are the safest way to, to move crude oil. And we're going to force that crude to be put on a tanker and shipped to be uh, on a boat that's, uh, that's unsafe or on rail that's unsafe to put on a boat to be refined in a refinery that doesn't have the kind of um, air emissions that we have on the Gulf Coast. I, you know, tell me, tell me how, if you can tell me how that makes sense, I, I'd be willing to listen. Um, and then finally, Mexican energy reform. It's not U.S. It's not something we control, but that's something that's, that's happening at a, at a, for those of us who've worked in Mexico. <laughs> Very surprised at the pace. There's a lot of opportunity and low-hanging fruit in Mexico, and, and I hope that they can get that done because it would be fantastic, not just for, for U.S. companies, but it would be fantastic for Mexico. So we're, we're looking at that, and hopefully the, the reform will, will, will pass. We've got some hurdles in the next three or four months, but we've, we've got our uh, fingers crossed on that. So that's a quick, a quick view, and now I'm going to pass the, the – clicker over to the smart guys in the room where they can tell you what's really happening in energy. <laughs> <laughs>